Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 193. A director's job is to make something happen, and it doesn't happen by itself. So you cajole, you flatter, you tell them what they want to hear just to get it done. If you don't bring that passion and that intensity to it, you shouldn't be doing it. James Cameron. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by taylorsound.com. One of the most complicated problems I've had in my professional career is sound, and sound mixing, sound design is generally always very expensive. But Taylor Sound has come onto the scene and has done something pretty incredible. Like so many other things you have in the world today, now you can get your sound design online. They're offering flat promotional rates for commercials, music videos, short films, and any other video content that's short form. They're very affordable, and because you are an Indie Film Hustle Tribe member, we'll get 15% off your order. Just type in the word hustle in the post your brief section. That's T-A-I-L-O-R sound.com. So today is the eve of Halloween, and I thought we have a spooky episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast, but yet informative on the filmmaking process. And today's guest is Jeffrey Michael Bays, and he wrote a book called Suspense with the Camera, The Filmmaker's Guide to Hitchcock's Techniques. And I actually wrote a quote for the book, which is on the back cover, because I love the book. I am a huge Hitchcock fan, and what Alfred Hitchcock did, uh, he's a master, and and especially a, a, a master of suspense, as his moniker states. But to create suspense, to create um, thrills, uh, excitement with camera movement uh, is something that I think is a lost art in a lot of today's films and a lot of filmmakers in today's world. Doesn't They don't take the time to learn that craft. And Jeffrey has done us a favor to put all of Hitchcock's techniques in this amazing book. And I wanted to have him on the show to talk about how Hitchcock does what he did and uh, really dive deep into creating suspense in your movies. And they could be suspense in a comedy. It could be suspense in a thriller, a horror, an action movie, whatever. As a, as a director, as a filmmaker, understanding how to create suspense in a scene is crucial. And Hitchcock in many ways did it on low budgets. He was able to create suspense Without showing a lot, he he created more with not showing, and that technique is super valuable not only in the storytelling process but in the indie film world where a lot of times we don't have the money to show the monster, and it's much more effective not to show the monster until the very very end or not at all. It's like some movies, but uh, but without any further ado, let's dive into it. Enjoy my conversation with Jeffrey Michael Bass. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeffrey Michael Bays. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, thanks. Thanks for being on the show, man, and and and, and hopefully teaching us how to scare the crap out of people. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan. Ah, oh, thank you, man. Thank you. And and you're I'm a big fan of yours as well. Your book, uh, Suspense with a Camera: The Filmmaker's Guide to Hitchcock's Techniques. It, it just resonates with me because I'm such a huge Hitchcock fan. He's probably one of my top five directors of all time. And uh, I think a lot of the newer generation of filmmakers has a, are doing themselves a disservice by not studying Hitchcock uh, and, and his techniques. I mean, he is a master. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, he started in the 1920s. And that's when it was like right before the transition to sound. Mm -hmm. And so he learned with a lot of um, visual filmmakers, you know, silent film days. And so a lot of those techniques that he uh, developed over the years, they actually came from uh, the silent film era, which, um, you know, it's kind of a lost art (laughs) at this point. Right, because he didn't really he didn't really care much about dialogue. (laughs) It was it wasn't like a thing for him. He was all about the visuals. And in the old silent and silent times, uh, silent uh, era, there was no dialogue. So you had to tell your story visually. And that's kind of he started that way and kind of developed that same technique over the years. So if you can combine good dialogue with his technique, I mean, you've got an amazing movie. That's true. And, you know, the funny thing about that is that 
he actually started out as a title designer mm-hmm. um, because they uh, they did they did have dialogue actually in silent films. It was actually text on the screen. Sure, of course. Right? So uh, and and nobody liked that. You know, that was just that was really inconvenient, and it was just as annoying then as it would have been today. Mm-hmm. Um, the you know the idea was. Uh, to tell the story with the least amount of those interruptions with the title cards. Uh, So the fact that he started out designing title cards kind of tells you everything about uh, why he, uh, when he started directing, that he didn't want to use any dialogue because it was just uh, a pain. Yeah. (laughs) It's a pain in the butt. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Now, why did you decide to go down the the rabbit hole on Hitchcock as opposed to any other of the amazing directors in cinema history? Well, I I guess it's always just been around with me since I was a kid. You know, I, uh, I, I started watching Hitchcock when I was 15 um, I was actually forced to watch uh, Rear Window. Uh, you know, it was so like, good. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting anything, you know, because you know, fifteen-year-old uh, old oh, yeah. movie. Mm-hmm. You know, this is going to be boring. This is gonna, there's nothing. You know, I'm going to be you know tortured by watching this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know, as it went on, I started to realize, wait, there's something different about this. Uh, it's actually it's pulled me in somehow. Um, there's a feeling of you feel present in the moment. There's, there's something live about it. Um, so there's just something different about what Hitchcock was doing. And that caught my attention as a 15 year old. And, uh, so I think that kind of started my interest. And then as I got into filmmaking, went to college, uh, I just kept learning more and more about his techniques. Um, and I guess I'm still at it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his he's he's I mean, he's made he made like how many films a total? I think it's like it was a lot. Uh, about 50. Yeah. Uh, 52, I think is the exact number. Um, there's one that's missing, I think, that's no longer uh, in existence. But uh, that we yeah. know of. Hopefully it will be found in a, in a vault somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, his first was The Lodger, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, that was one of the first. Um there was it actually came out about the same time now here's the thing about his first three films is that they were actually filmed in a different sequence than they were released uh mm-hmm. because his first film um which i've forgotten the name of it already but mm-hmm. uh it uh wasn't released until like a year after the production f- the uh the next film because uh, I guess the producers didn't like it, and then they realized, oh, wait a minute, I, I, it actually is pretty good. <laughs> so, I mean, but he was yeah. doing some amazing stuff even back then, like seeing through floors, and that was like uh, that was very revolutionary at the time. Like, so you could actually see the footsteps above you and, and things like that. He was yeah. already thinking at such a different level than the rest of the, the filmmakers at the time. That was pretty amazing. Now, can you answer this very basic question? What is suspense? Well, you know, nobody really knows. Nobody can agree on the answer. Um, in fact, film theorists and psychologists don't agree. So, <laughs> right. uh, you know, psychologists think that it's that it's about uncertainty, um, that you're uncertain about the outcome. Um, you want the good thing to happen, but you're afraid the bad thing's going to happen. Um, but film theorists... Um, have kind of turned that on its head, and and there's this thing called the paradox of suspense. Mm-hmm. Okay, so to get into a little bit of science here, mm-hmm. what they found is that if you watch a film the second time, uh, the suspense is even greater in some cases. So how does that make sense? If you know what's going to happen, mm-hmm. then there really is no uncertainty the second time you watch it, right? Right. It's not really about uncertainty at all. It's more just about uh, setting up these situations of fear in which a secret is about to to be released to the other characters or something bad is going to happen. But it's that moment where you provoke the audience into wanting to reach into the screen and and fix things to prevent a tragedy. And it's that audience provocation. That's what suspense is. Now, if I remember correctly, and, and you can definitely correct me on this, the I saw an interview with Hitchcock before, and his definition of of suspense was uh, if you're sitting at that table uh, in the middle of like in a restaurant somewhere, mm-hmm. and two people are talking about nothing, you know, just talking about their daily life, and all of a sudden, an explosion happens, and everyone yeah. dies in the building. 
there's no suspense there. But at the beginning, if you feed the audience just as they're sitting down talking that there's a bomb underneath and now they're talking about baseball, everyone in the audience is like, stop talking about baseball. And that's that creates this kind of suspense. But he said the one rule that you can never break is you can never let the bomb go off because if it does, the audience will be very pissed. And he did it in one movie and he says, and the audience was very square with me. (laughs) Is that, have you heard that story? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's his bomb theory. Um, And basically that's just about giving the audience more information than the characters have so that, so that you know what's going to happen or you think you know what's going to happen. See, that's the key is that you build the audience up to think they know what's Mm -hmm. happening or what's about to happen. And then you pull the rug out at the last minute and something else happens instead. Um, And that twist is what makes the suspense enjoyable because if you just let the bomb go off, you know, after five minutes of suspense, then it's like, Oh, okay. (laughs) <laughs> the bomb went off and uh, that's kind of boring. <laughs> yeah, right. But if they escape the danger, it becomes a little bit a little bit better. Yeah, exactly. Now, what can you tell the audience what a MacGuffin is? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, and I know that's a, it's a tough question sometimes, but <laughs> you're throwing curveballs here already. <laughs> um yeah, so a MacGuffin is well, it's been around for centuries in storytelling. It, it's kind of like a plot device. Um, it's, you know, the things that the, the, the villains are after. It's like the secret plans that, that you know, they have to, to try to, to get. And, uh, you know, it's kind of it's a it's a reason for the story to happen. Mm-hmm. But with Hitchcock, it's more about um, it's a reason that doesn't matter. Right, he doesn't care. He doesn't really care about if it's if it's uh, microfilm or plans for a nuclear yeah. bomb or uh, 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 um, some sort of chemical. He doesn't care. It just right. It's all. It's almost like X in an algebraic equation. Right. You know, it could be anything. It's a variable. You know, you, you change it to something else, the story stays the same. Right, because all so, the action, will st- everyone's still trying to protect that or get that. So the actual thing doesn't really matter as much for him. Exactly. So even in a psychological film where, like, for instance, uh, Marnie, mm-hmm. which is one of his later films, um, the MacGuffin in Marnie is the color red because that's the thing that freaks her out. Um, she's got this kind of psychological hang up about every time she sees red, mm-hmm. uh, then she freaks out. Um, that's the MacGuffin. It could be anything, right? She could freak out about bunny rabbits or, uh, yeah. you know, uh, any anything. It, it's still the same story because the story is actually about um, the other guy blackmailing her, um, you know, to control her. Right. So, right. Yeah, because a lot of people don't understand what the MacGuffin is. So hopefully the audience has a little bit of a better understanding of what that is now. Now, Yeah, and in, in the book I kind of break that down into uh, – some different ways you can use it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I think it's, it's, um, the reason the Hitchcock, um, um, it, it became prevalent in his works is because he was, he was such a visual storyteller mm-hmm. and there's something about when you're using the camera to tell a story, you're able to move the camera around the scene and give the audience different, uh, perspectives um, you bring the audience into the character in such uh, an intimate level um, that a lot of the story doesn't isn't really quite as prominent anymore. Um, and what I mean by that is that on the stage, it's mostly dialogue. Right. Um, the actors are speaking dialogue, and there's it's dramatics of you know talking back and forth, um, and you have the same perspective all the way through the play, um, unless you move to a different seat. <laughs> right. But, but arguably you're in the same perspective in the theater. Yeah. But uh, film is, is more abbreviated in its way of storytelling so that some of these plot elements kind of just kind of fall to the wayside and aren't really quite as important because you're, you're, you're the audience is, is more interested in the reaction shots and, you know, the secrets and, you know, the emotional world. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I'm a guffin, uh, is so important in, in a suspense film is because um, it's just it, it's kind of a throwaway uh, one of those things that don't matter. Right, exactly. Now, there's a lot of suspense myths out there. Can you discuss what suspenseful lighting is and isn't? Okay, well, yeah, and these myths that I have, uh, there are things that you shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
or you don't need to do if you want suspense. And it's kind of misconceptions that if you know you want suspense, then it has to be dark. Right. Um, you have to have shadows. You have to have you know it has to be nighttime. Um, and that's not that's not really true. In fact, Hitchcock um, set out to prove that uh, many times. He put most of his suspense in the sunshine. Right. Um, the crop the crop duster scene in uh, North by Northwest. Oh, so good. It's in the middle of the afternoon, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know the suspense is uh, in the middle of an open field, <laughs> mm-hmm. as a plane you know tries to kill uh, Cary Grant. So. Um, lighting, it really doesn't matter so much. It, um, it's all about the technique as, as of, yeah. of creating the suspense. And it's about the setup, you know, it, it has not, nothing to do with, uh, being dark and, and spooky. I mean, you know, you can, you can make it dark, but it's not necessary. Now, what are some tips you have for creating suspense with a camera? <laughs> I know there's a, um, that's a loaded question. There's thousands of them, but just a couple. Um, well, okay, with a camera, I mean, that kind of brings up the uh, the whole secrets aspect because that's that's what I kind of outline in the book is that the easiest way for a filmmaker to set up a suspense scenario mm-hmm. is to have a secret um, that the protagonist knows. And none of the other characters know the secret. And you bring the audience into that secret. And then you set up suspense around, is that secret going to get out? Um, and so you create these scenes where um, it almost gets out. Okay, and the secret can be anything. It can be, you know, a dead body, which... Uh, Hitchcock did a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a few dead bodies work. in his movies, yes. <laughs> yeah, there's a few, yeah. There's a couple. Um, but it could be, you know, something uh, like a pregnancy that happens in soap operas a lot. In fact, soap operas use suspense quite often mm-hmm. um, because these are things, you know, that one character can hide. And then when they're, uh, you know, confronted by another character, um, the secret could almost get out and they have to lie about it. And when the protagonist lies about it, then the audience kind of feels privileged. They, they know secret information, and it, it's, it forms a bond with the audience. And it also provokes the audience into thinking, um, he just lied. That's, that's not right. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it gets us you know, involved, and it's kind of like um, uh, we're, sh- we're, we're, getting, we're involved in kind of a and the reason the reason this <laughs> we started out talking about the camera mm-hmm. uh, is because the camera is the way uh, to bring the audience into the secret, right? Um, so that you pan into an object, um, or you pan into, or you zoom into a face, um, or during a conversation, two people are talking, um, and the camera focuses on one of the characters hiding something. So that's how the camera comes into play. There's not a lot of that anymore. I don't see it as much as I used to uh, with with current day films. Is is that a fair statement? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, over the shoulder shots, mm-hmm. and Hitchcock didn't use over the shoulder shots. Um, Any specific reason? Y- you know, I think um, it's probably because. Um, it's, well, what I like to think about it is that if, is that the camera is actually, uh, the audience, mm-hmm. uh, sitting in the room. Um, and so when you, when you, uh, when you're doing the over shoulder kind of editing, you're, you're flipping back and forth. Right. So that, you know, the camera is not in one spot. Uh, so it's kind of disorienting and it kind of brings you out of the moment. Um, but if you have uh, the camera in one place and um, the people, the two people are talking, um, then uh, w- the way you move the camera, uh, it makes you feel more like you're standing there watching mm-hmm. them. Got it. 
Now, Does it, that make sense? It makes perfect sense. No, no, no. It makes perfect right. sense. It makes perfect sense. I mean, the camera, you can use the camera in so many different ways. Uh, but I think, uh, again, a lot of, especially indie filmmakers, don't use the camera uh, to tell their story a lot of times. They use either – they rely so much heavily on dialogue um, or – or, or, you know, the, the situation to tell the story as opposed to really crafting and using the, the, the camera as a paintbrush for your, for your masterpiece or for your painting that you're painting. And that's what Hitchcock did arguably better than anybody else, especially in his genre, that he was able to just jump in and go out and completely – like that shot in Notorious. Uh, it's one of my favorite shots of in all of Hitchcockian film. That one shot at the top of the stairs, and he just cranes forever all the way down to finally till you see – you have no idea where the camera is going to go until you finally go into that real close-up of the back of Igmar Ig- 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 Bergman's hand where she has a key, which is obviously a part of the plot. And uh, it's such an amazing shot. But you don't see that anymore. You, that's like – that's bold in today's world. Yeah. Is, that, is that fair? Yeah, and that's not just some kind of random, you know, establishing shot. <laughs> no. um, because it's telling a story. It's it's visually it's like a visual sentence. The director is saying, "Okay, here's a here's a room full of people, <laughs> and here's a woman, and she's holding a key, and this key is uh, a, really important to this woman, and nobody else knows about it." So you've you've told that story. Just in that one long shot, and you, with no dialogue, you've made it important yeah, with no dialogue. Now, in your book, you do discuss the the concept of visual a visual sentence. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, yeah, I mean, this is it's basically it's shot by shot. Uh, what story are you telling? Um, and the visual sentence is ideas created um, by putting shots together, mm-hmm. so that if you, you know. You put together a, a close up of a person looking, um, and then you cut to something they're looking at, and then you cut back to their reaction. Um, that is a visual sentence because you're showing what they're looking at. And with that is an idea. Um, the example I use in the book is that a man is looking at a burlap sack. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, then he looks down at a dead body. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, with the dead bodies. I mean, of course. Um, yeah. Um, and so when you cut back and forth from him looking to the sack and then looking at the body, then you kind of you've processed this idea that, OK, maybe he can put the body into the sack. Right. <laughs> right. So it, so just by visual, you know, putting these shots together, um, you're you're um, you're getting the audience involved in the thought process of the protagonist. And how they're processing, you know, what they can do in this world. You know, what can you do with a sack? Um, he goes over, uh, he gets a shovel, he gets a rope. So you kind of put these objects together mm-hmm. and that's your story. You know, that's your storytelling. And, you know, you don't need dialogue for that. Um, and this, you know, the visual sentences, um, it gets more elaborate. You can add more things to it. In fact, you know, the entire film of Rear Window is um, Jimmy Stewart looking out a window and then reacting to what he sees. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's all visual sentences. There's not a lot of dialogue in Rear Window, is there? Well, yeah, there is. There there is dialogue, but like I remember it. (laughs) What I remember is not the dialogue. All I do is remember is the visuals of that movie. Yeah. Uh, Now, what is a Hitchcockian open? Okay, well, that's that's kind of like the notorious thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's the camera... Um, pulling the audience into a, a secretive world. So um, often he would start out in a public space, like a crowd of people, and then the camera would, you know, kind of pick a person and start following that person. Or you would uh, pan the camera across uh, some buildings, and then you you pan into a a window. You pick out a window to look into, and then you go into the to the house and you see what's inside so it's kind of um it's uh it's bringing the audience from a public space into a private world private secretive world and uh and and the other thing about hitchcock is that he always opened his films 
as comedies. Um, <laughs> and that, that kind of sounds counterintuitive, right? That right. you would, if you want to build suspense, why are you opening a film with as a comedy? Um, and he did that almost exclusively throughout his career. Um, even North by Northwest has kind of comic music in the opening. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because um, he thought that uh, first you want the audience to start to like the characters and to have fun with them. Mm -hmm. And so if they're having fun, if they're, you know, if it's comedic, then you care about them more before something bad happens. And it also creates kind of a, a really strong contrast when something bad does happen, then it's a sudden shift to the dramatic. Right. You, you, he lures you in. A little bit. And yeah. then, then he spanks you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But he was, he was, he was the genius of that. He, he always said that he wanted uh, to play the audience like a, a piano. Like if I hit this note, you're going to do this. If I hit that note, you're going to do that. And that's uh, kind of what he wanted to do with all his movies. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, he said that the camera is like a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. um, in that the close ups, you know, are, the uh, most important notes and then the uh, the wide shots or other notes. And it's, it's all about emphasis um, and rhythms. And um, so that every, um, every moment um, carries with it a certain uh, emphasis and that all of your close-ups are, are your emotional mm -hmm. um, story and all the wide shots are more objective. And so that's why he was able to uh, storyboard all of his films beforehand. And uh, the editors would have no choice, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Follow exactly what only, I did. Right. There's, a, there's a, only one way to cut it because he would only shoot um, exactly what was needed in terms of close up here, wide shot here, medium shot here. Um, and so – that was all part of his plan going in was that orchestration of the camera. He never, but he, it was, it was never found in the edit. Like many, like most movies right. are, it's never found in the edit or recut in the edit. He had such a clear vision of what he was attempting to do. I'm sure at one point or another, he must've run into some trouble, but maybe he didn't. Maybe he was a, a, such a master that he just always cut it exactly the way he had it on paper, which, uh, which is insane. <laughs> but true. Yeah. And now, his producers didn't like that either because, you know, especially yes. back in the 40s and 50s, yes. um, producers were all about, you know, controlling and changing the edit. Mm -hmm. um, and they couldn't do it with his films because there was no other way to cut it. <laughs> you know, there was no other footage to, to use in the, in the scene. So. Well, that's a smart way to, to maintain director's <laughs> yeah. cut, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Now, can you discuss uh, – in the book, you discuss a little bit about the syntax of eyes, hands, and feet. Can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, um, basically, this is all about um, telling the story. Those are those are your those are the words that you have in the visual sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you're crafting a visual sentence, you have eyes, hands, and feet, and objects which the hands can manipulate. Mm -hmm. So, it's I, I compare it to uh, a computer game. Mm -hmm. um, there's a type of computer game. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still out there, but in the nineties, there was a type of computer game where you, you, you it's like a, um, where you have, you're in a room and there's objects and you have to, you, you tell the character to, you know, look at this object, grab this object. Um, and, and by putting two objects together, you create a tool that, you know, you can escape the room, you know? So that's, that's kind of, and that's the way of bringing the, you know, the player into the world and to manipulate the story of the game um, is through objects. Um, it's the same way in a suspense film because um, by focusing on objects and by telling the story through objects, um, then that's how you bring the audience in. It makes them feel like they're, they're a part of the story and that they can, um, if they could reach in, then they could manipulate the uh, – the film in the same way. Now, uh, Hitchcock was a master of building danger off screen. Can you share a few tips on how Hitchcock did it so well? Off screen. Uh, so basically by what you don't show, um, 
Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Basically, like, when you, like, you know, instead of showing the murder, you hear the murder. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that's the thing. Once you build up the suspense, um, you really don't have to show it. Uh, because the audience is already so involved. Um, and you, by not showing it, uh, like for instance, there's a, there's an episode of his TV show called Revenge where he actually has a murder, uh, that takes place off screen. Um, a guy walks into a hotel room and the camera stays on the door of the hotel. Um, and you see the man walk in and walk off camera and then you hear, um, him, uh, stabbing the guy and killing him, but you don't see it, but you know it's happening and the camera doesn't move. So all you have is this empty shot of this doorway. And that is, um, it's more, you know, scary than showing it because it's in your head. Um, because you've evoked the imagination um, and it happens in your head. It's not on the screen. So like the perfect example is the psycho shower sequence, which is probably yeah. one of the most studied sequences in, in film history. Um, yeah. uh, the knife never penetrates her. It never right. cuts her at all uh, in the entire sequence. But yet the mind connects all of those images, which I think it was like, what, 78 shots, 98 shots, something like that in a, in, in, in a 45 second or 30 second. I don't even remember exactly the numbers, but all of those shots – connected into a murder sequence but you never actually see an actual murder arguably you know you don't ever see that knife penetrate her skin so that is the master i mean he took i think he what, took three days to shoot that two and a half three days to yeah. shoot like yeah. 90 seconds <laughs> yeah <laughs> must be nice to be the to be the boss back then <laughs> uh yeah and that, that's all about montage and uh the the brain uh, finds its own continuity, you know. Mm -hmm. It was it was just as a, I actually worked at Universal Studios, uh, Florida, back in the day in the nineties, and they had the Hitchcock ride, which I yeah. literally would just sit and w just stay in there forever. And they had a whole live presentation of the shower sequence. They brought <sighs> they brought the set out the way the the, do the you know the walls would fall away and you know all this kind of stuff. It was just fascinating to watch. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the Hitchcock brand and how Hitch was the first director to really brand himself? Yeah. And, you know, this started, uh, you know, he actually, when he was uh, a teenager, uh, he was actually in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, he worked at a, a company that made uh, telegraph cable. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was in the marketing department of um, – I guess he designed the catalog or something, the product catalog. And he also designed, uh, you know, advertisements that they would publish elsewhere. And so he, he was involved in marketing and publicity early on. So by the time he became a director, like in his mid twenties, he already had this background, this intimate kind of knowledge of the underpinnings of advertising. And so he knew how to promote himself. And, uh, he would actually um, – that's that's part of why he uh, kept putting cameos of himself in his films because he realized that the newspapers would talk about it. Um, <laughs> in fact, they would talk about more about him than the actors, um, and that was that was kind of unheard of at the time. It's still um, it's still actually unheard of. There's not many directors that get more of a spotlight than the, the actors in their movies or the movies themselves. Yeah. And so, and so he would do that. He would manipulate the press like that. In fact, he would actually plant stories about his weight. Um, and getting the press to talk about the fact, you know, he lost 20 pounds last week mm -hmm. and uh, here's how he did it. So he's, he's getting people to think about his image because part of his brand is that profile, that unique profile of his face. And so, um, any way he could get the press to talk about it, um, then that was publicity for him. And so what you see in his films is that he, his brand and his persona is so interweaved into his style, into his camera moves, and everything about his films so that even today, 40 years later, mm 
uh, you still feel his presence. You do. Um, <laughs> you do. Yeah. It, it's it's go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So you st- you feel this director um, telling a story, and you feel like he's still there. And there's not many guys from his time uh, that uh, that still has that resonance, you know, that that just sits there and it just, you know, everybody knows that profile. You know, anyone who's yeah. watched movies have he- has heard of Hitchcock. You know, he's just one of those directors, and uh, he's he's a, 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 just a masterful. He was ma- you're right. He was masterful in branding, and I think that's something that's so missing today in cinema uh, in general is under and for specifically indie filmmakers is the branding aspect of things the marketing aspects of things and he was a master not only of suspense but of marketing i mean, remember the the psycho uh release what a masterful marketing campaign that was that he would shut the door at a certain time and not let anybody else in and yeah. and, and he asked make sure don't ruin it for anybody and it's pretty masterful back then and how much control do you think he had over the marketing of his films? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm sure he had, you know, quite a bit of input. More than most. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially during the 60s, because by, you know, by 1960, he was like the biggest director ever. So, you know, yeah, there was a golden age. You pretty much get anything you wanted. Yeah, there was a golden age of his work, which started with, uh, which, what, what, what film did you think he would be, would be? Like, because there's that group of like six or seven movies that he was just at the top of his game: The Vertigo, The Rear Window, Psycho, uh, North by Northwest. That 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 period. What do you do? You know what the years were by any chance? Yeah, so pretty much, you know, 1950s up to 1960. Psycho was 1960, which is kind of the end of that mm-hmm. kind of golden era. Because after that, after Psycho, he kind of went a different direction. Yeah, then he started. Uh, he was already he already had his TV show at that point. Right, and the TV show started in '55. Right, and I think that would be the year that he was probably at his peak, uh, because he was he was making like three or four films a year at that point. I mean, within a very short span of time, he had Rear Window and uh, North by Northwest and Vertigo and all these films, you know, and um, all masterpieces, you know, all masterpieces yeah. at that time, yeah. Without question, he was hitting. He was hitting home run after home run during that right. period, and uh, and I do and remember. Was, go ahead. And he was about fifty five at the time, so you know, because uh, he was born in eighteen ninety nine. So you can Jeez. easily figure out his age. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, if if you're not fifty five yet as a filmmaker, there's still hope. <laughs> right, right, right. Without without question. Yeah, because he took a while. It took, yeah, it took him, yeah, but he worked, he worked, but it took him a while before yeah. he hit his stride. Uh, yeah. And um, and I do remember the story of Psycho that he actually the studio didn't want to give him the money or they gave him a really low budget, so he took his TV crew, and that's who made the movie, which was unheard of at the time, a television crew doing a feature film for a studio. Yeah, and he yeah. did that, and, and that's how he was able to move so quickly and and so on. Like I said, I'm I'm a little bit of a Hitchcock uh, fan <laughs> as well, so I like to, I like to geek out with some Hitchcock every once in a while. <laughs> now, what are some current day films that Hitchcock would be proud of, in your opinion? Um, well, I think um, Ten Cloverfield Lane uh, is is one of the ones that comes to mind recently. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan Trachtenberg, uh, I actually have a an interview with him in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I think is is very Hitchcock. Um, a lot of the Coen Brothers' work is ah, very, yes. uh, very Hitchcock. I think the reason uh, the similarity there is because of the humor, uh, the use of comedy, uh, which was really important to Hitchcock's work as well. Um, because Hitchcock, uh, he said that it, you know it's entertainment. Uh, you don't want to depress the audience, <laughs> so you have to keep things light and fun. So even in the darkest uh, scenarios, uh, he would always find a way to make it funny um, and uh, insert a little bit of uh, humor or irony. And Um, and macabre as well. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, So that you're always kind of on the edge between laughs and screams. So it's just kind of teetering back and forth between 
those two. Uh, and so, you know, that's what the Coen brothers do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, David Fincher obviously um, uh, does a lot of Hitchcockian type of work. Um, and, you know, I, I like to compare the Born Identity uh, films mm-hmm. uh, to Hitchcock. Um, very similar, especially the first one, mm-hmm. uh, because, um, you know, it's, it's a similar type of uh, character, like, being chased through geographic space mm-hmm. and kind of hiding and, you know, uncovering uh, information. And uh, so that's very similar to what Hitchcock would do. Um, so, yeah. Oh, and also uh, the new series on HBO uh, called Room 104. Yes, the, has, the Duplass brothers. Yeah, a lot of Hitchcockian type of work there. There's some episodes that are just really, really awesome suspense. Um, I mean, do, would you agree that I think that indie filmmakers have a tremendous opportunity on a lower budget to really tell some fascinating stories if they're able to employ some of Hitchcock's techniques. Uh, and, and not only in the horror or in the thriller, but just as it's as, as suspenseful, telling a good story, but using the camera uh, and not using a lot of dialogue, which I know that's a, a hamper, it hampers a lot of filmmakers who are not writers uh, to tell, try to tell that story visually. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't need a lot of money for this. Um and, you know, I think that if Hitchcock were alive today, he would be, you know, he would have a web series. <laughs> you know, he, he, he would have a YouTube channel, you know. It'd be a hell of uh, a YouTube he was, channel. <laughs> <laughs> he was always about experimenting with new things, you know, new formats. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, you know, that was a big deal when he went to television in the 50s because nobody else was doing that. That's right. So. That was the anti that the Hollywood hated television when it first yes. came out. So yeah, you can you know anybody can do it. Now um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my uh, all my guests. Uh, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career besides your own book, of course? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think um, with Hitchcock, it would have to go back to the. Um, Francois Truffaut yeah, interview. Yeah, I, was, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's that's kind of that. You know, it took me about three years to actually read that book because mm-hmm. I was like reading parts of it, you know, you know, off and on. Um, but yeah, that was so inspiring. Oh, God, it was the first time Truffaut, who was considered an auteur, um, interviewed Hitchcock, which at the time Hitchcock was kind of considered just kind of like a oh, he just makes popular movies. He's not to be taken too seriously. And and Truffaut was the one that brought him into the spotlight. And oh my God, this guy really has some thought behind what he's doing. And there is technique, and there is art uh, with what Hitchcock was doing. And uh, it was a it's a if, if anyone listening has not read the Hitchcock Truffaut book, it's it's required reading for all filmmakers, as well as the documentary uh, Hitchcock Truffaut, which I just saw recently, which ama- which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Now um, but the book is the book is a lot. Better. Oh, of course. No, the book is a lot <laughs> denser, but the doc the doc really talks a lot about how they put it together and and just how funny Hitchcock was, <laughs> like the pictures they took and why they took the pictures and all that <laughs> kind of good stuff. Now, what lesson took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life? Uh <laughs> I know these are deep. Um, these are deep. What what lesson took me the longest to learn? Uh well, uh, the one thing that that I think is important is to always uh, impose limitations mm-hmm. onto yourself and onto your work, um, and that's where the most creativity comes from. Um, so that if you if you start out a film and you you say, okay, it's just going to be handheld camera shots, we're not going to use a tripod, and we're just going to use natural lighting. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you decide that's how you're going to do it, stick with it. Um, because what can happen is that, you know, you could be pushed into, you know, expanding and doing bigger things and then the film might become too much of a monster to handle. Right. So always, uh, you want creative, uh, limitations. I think that's an important thing. Um, so low budgets actually make you a better filmmaker. Yeah, I would say so. 
I, I, I preach that all the time. If you, if you're given a hundred million dollars, you have no idea and you just throw the money hose at problems. You never learn. Uh, yeah. But if you haven't, you can't figure it out that then you have to try to figure it out because there is no other option. It's kind of like burning the boats once you get to the shore. Like there's no going back. <laughs> yeah. now, now, what are three of your favorite Hitchcockian films of all time? Um, Hitchcockian, you mean the Hitchcock films? Hitchcock? No, Hitchcock oh. films. Hitchcock films. Um, well, um, you know, that always changes for me because there's so many. <laughs> yes. Um, and each time I see one, it's it's different than, you know, it, it kind of changes. Um, As of I, I do, for today. Well, um, I recently saw I Confess, mm-hmm. um, which is an early black and white Hitchcock film. And I really like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was surprised by it. It's one of the lesser known films. Um, also, I like Strangers on a Train. Which, uh, which one? Because there's two strangers on the train, if I remember correctly. Um, it's the, the black, black and white. And white. The, the first yeah. one? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not the remake, because he remade his own movie a, a couple decades later. Um, if I'm not mistaken, right? That was Man Who Knew Too Much, I think. So it's two, you know. there's two men who knew too much. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's the one. Excuse me. Thank you for correcting me. Yes. Yeah, because that's the film he remade of, of his earlier British version. Got it. Got um, it. Oh, Strangers that's on the Train good. is great, actually. I love Strangers on the Train. That's a good film, too, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I also like Rope. Um, oh, I love and Rope. You, you, said, you said you're getting ready. Uh, to- no, 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 we can't talk about anything. <laughs> can't talk, about, can't anything. talk about it. We can't talk about it. But, but the but, style the style of you know a single shot, um, that's camera orchestration right there. If you want to learn about orchestration, yeah. watch that movie. He did, what, seven takes in that whole movie? Yeah. Yeah, it's, but it's all as if one take. Right. Or there's a couple of cuts, but you know they're dramatic cuts. Right. But um, exactly. But it's all about you know um, a dolly in on an important moment. You know, it's uh, all the you know it's all the shots are there, but right. you just don't cut. You move the camera instead of cutting. <laughs> so yeah, he um he I read somewhere that he was not. Years later, he felt that he felt kind of discouraged by Rope because he felt that it wasn't uh, his best work and it was just an experiment gone wrong, in his opinion, is what I read, uh, which I disagree with Mr. Hitchcock respectfully. I think Rope is a, it's a masterpiece as well. But I guess at the time, it was not well received uh, only years later. But that's a lot of great art is not well received. I mean, look at Kubrick. Yeah. I mean, yeah. every Kubrick movie that came out, everyone was like, ah, and then 10 years later, masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> Now and he tried it again with uh, uh, Under Capricorn, and that oh, yeah. film didn't work. So it, it may be the failure of that second try that uh, caused him to give up on the whole idea. But but yeah, it's still, I would like to see him brilliant. with a digital. I still like to see him with a digital camera today, and he could just yeah. shoot forever and not have to worry about it. I always yeah. wondered. I always wondered, like, what would Kubrick? What would Hitchcock uh, and and some of these great uh, directors, Kurosawa, all these great directors of the of yesteryear with today's technology, what they would do, and what yeah. kind of, what amazing art that would be created today. Um, now, where can people find you online, and where can people get the book? Okay, well, the book is available um, most major booksellers. It's in Barnes and Noble. Um, it's uh, on Amazon. You can get it from the publisher at mwp.com, mm-hmm. michaelluisiproductions.com. Um, and uh, my website is borgus.com, B-O-R-G-U-S.com. Uh, you can Google my name. You'll find things. Uh, you do. You have an amazing YouTube channel as well. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying it as a statement, and, and please tell people about it. <laughs> um, well, okay. It's, it's uh, Borgus Film on YouTube. Um, and we have our Hitch 20 series, which it's uh, three hours of uh, detailed analysis of Hitchcock's 20 episodes of television. That's insane. <laughs> and that that is definitely something to check out. Yeah, I, I actually, when I was doing research on Hitchcock, I, I came across your site. And I think that's how we kind of ran into each other eventually um, was I started posting some of your stuff as well. Because it was just such good stuff. And there's just nothing out there like it. So if you guys are interested in Hitchcock at all, uh, I'll put his, I'll put all this in the show notes so you guys can go check it out. But the the videos uh, are a great companion to his book. And the book, again, is called Suspense, 
with a camera, the filmmaker's guide to Hitchcock's techniques. Jeffrey, thank you so much for being on the show, man. It has been an absolute pleasure geeking out with, uh, with Hitchcock and yourself. Great. Thank you. Hitchcock was the master. He's arguably one of my top five directors of all time. And if you are a filmmaker, you are doing yourself a disservice if you do not study Mr. Hitchcock's work. And in all honesty, if you guys are going down the rabbit hole on, on Alfred, please check out uh, Jeffrey's amazing 20-episode series on every episode he ever directed on the Alfred Hitchcock Presents show. And they break down everything about those episodes and really gives you an insight on what uh, Hitch was doing during those years. And I'll have all the links to everything from Jeffrey's book to his video series and everything he does at our show notes for this episode at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 193. And I want to thank you for all the emails and all the questions I've been getting from the tribe for the new show, Ask Alex. I really appreciate it. And please, it's not too late. Please send more questions. I'm still picking and choosing which ones I'm going to use. Just email me at ifhsubmissions at gmail.com. Leave me your question and I will take a read of it and see if it gets on the show. But please send the questions. I want to read them. I want to answer them as best I can. So thank you guys. And tomorrow we will be releasing the next installment of the director series on our YouTube channel. This week is Christopher Nolan and breaking down Batman Begins. Definitely, it's it's just such a geek fest. I love that episode so, so much. If you're a Nolan fan, please check it out at IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash YouTube, and you can subscribe on our YouTube channel. And guys, we're almost at 10,000. I think by tomorrow, we might break 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. So grateful, so humbled, and growing. And, uh, and also our Facebook page. If you haven't been to our Facebook page, definitely check it out. We're almost at 50,000 likes on our Facebook page. So the audience is growing. The tribe is growing. So please keep spreading the word as much as you can to everybody you know and try to help. I'm trying to help as many filmmakers as we can out there around the world. So for all of my listeners in the U.S., happy Halloween. Don't eat too much candy. Scare the hell out of people. Oh, and by the way, I, I just have to, on a side note, if you guys, any of you guys out there have Netflix, you need to watch Stranger Things. For God's sakes, please watch Stranger Things. I just finished binging it on Saturday, and it was amazing. Uh, if you like the first season, the second season is great. No spoilers, I promise, but just watch it. It's so great. It's such a wonderful uh, study in nostalgia and how the Duffer, Bro Duffer Brothers put together these amazing stories. We actually released a whole bunch of articles last week about exactly how they do character and break down character and all that kind of good stuff. But finally saw it. Definitely check it out on Netflix, guys. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 